the 40 years is coming to an end as the older generation dies in the wilderness. But we'll soon find out if the next generation succeeds where their parents failed. On The Bible Brief. I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. From Exodus chapters 20 and 34. There's a principle that comes out of the Bible when God describes his response to people. And the principle is this. A believer in God who depends upon him will receive mercy from God, grace and forgiveness while the unbeliever who rejects God will receive judgment from God. But this principle has an extension to it as well. When one has faith in God, Yahweh ensures that this faith has some effect on generations extending from that person. Similarly, when one rejects God, that has an effect on following generations as well. But note the contrast of the effects in both of the passages we read above. The effects of the faithful will last a thousand generations, while the effects of the faithless will last three or four generations. God's mercy is on display as he limits the effects of the faithlessness of the faithless. God's grace is on display when he expands the impact of faithfulness to generations yet unnamed. Now to be clear, the faithfulness of one generation never guarantees the same of the next. And this goes for faithlessness, too. Instead, the actions of one generation create a context and an example that the next generation can choose to mimic or choose to reject. The faithful gives an example of walking closely with God and those close to Him benefit from His faith. The faithless gives an example of rejecting God and choosing a life of confusion. And yet, as we already read, the effects of the faithful last far longer than the effects of the faithless. We're all walking in the context of those who came before us. We see all their examples, and we see the many effects of their lives on us. The question for us and for every generation is this. Will we follow the faithful, or will we follow the faithless? The Israelites are in the final months of their 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years as a judgment for the older generation's unbelief in God. Instead of entering the promised land of Canaan, they had instead shrunk back in fear, showing a total lack of faith in God who had delivered them from all their troubles. At Kadesh, they doubted God's power to drive out the inhabitants of the land before them. They doubted God's intention to bring them into the land flowing with milk and honey. They doubted God's promises to their forefathers, of which they were living proof. That generation rejected God and showed themselves faithless. But that generation was dying out. The forty years in the wilderness was coming to a close. And as that generation dies out, the next generation is presented with the choice. Will we follow the faithful? Or will we follow the faithless? And so we pick up the story with this generation at the same place as the last. After nearly four decades of wandering in the wilderness, they are back at Kadesh. And here, they're presented with a familiar problem. A problem faced by their fathers. We read this in Numbers chapter 20, verse 2. Now there was no water for the congregation. Now remember that many in this generation experienced God's other miracles when they were younger. The generation that was to die in the wilderness was all of those 20 years old and upward when the census was taken nearly 40 years prior. So a substantial portion of this next generation 
was old enough to have seen the log thrown into the bitter water, and the water come out of the rock. They had seen God's power, and they knew what he could do. But how would they respond to this all-too-familiar issue? Let's keep reading. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord! Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Sadly enough, they respond to this obstacle in a way just like their fathers. Instead of depending upon Yahweh and asking Him to provide, they choose grumbling and quarreling. Instead of asking Moses to intercede for them, they accuse Him. Instead of thankfulness for the provisions that God had sustained them with for 40 years, they complain about being away from their Egyptian foods. And yet, Despite God's right to judge this generation for their faithlessness, through Moses he provides grace to them, just as he did to their fathers when they were thirsty. Next we read, Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to them, saying, Take a staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them, and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord, as he commanded him. Yahweh doesn't immediately comment on the faithlessness of the people. Instead, he desires to vindicate himself to them, and provide another sign for them to believe. He says that Moses and Aaron should simply speak to the rock, and the rock will produce water for them and their cattle. The scene unfolds from here, and as you'll notice from Moses, he's livid and angry with this congregation. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. As readers, we should see the miracle and marvel at God's grace on this generation who lacks faith just like their fathers. But we also shouldn't miss something very important. Do you remember what God told Moses to do to the rock? God said, Tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. But that's not what Moses did, is it? The text said that Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. Not only that, but there's a hint in here that Moses and Aaron may be taking a bit of credit for bringing water out of the rock, as if they're doing it by their own power. They had started addressing the congregation by saying, Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? They didn't mention that it was God's power that was providing the water. And next we see God's response to their actions. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Moses certainly isn't perfect. We've seen his doubts and his wavering before, but we've also seen his incredible faith in the midst of the grumbling and near stoning by his fellow Israelites. Moses, after all, was the leader that God chose for the nation to bring them up out of Egyptian slavery. Perhaps, though, Moses fell into the trap that many others have fallen into as well. Perhaps he thought that leadership eventually made him exempt from the same standard as everyone else. Maybe his anger with the people set him over the edge and clouded his reason. We don't know the internal mind of Moses, but we do know that God saw the actions of Moses and his brother Aaron as a breach of faith. After all, God says the reasoning for his judgment is, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people. Moses and Aaron would suffer the same fate as those dying in the wilderness. Just as the older generation was perishing in the wilderness for their unbelief, so also Moses and Aaron would perish in the wilderness for unbelief. 
Death in the wilderness was the judgment on Moses and Aaron, just as it was for thousands of others in the wilderness between Egypt and Canaan. They would never set foot in the promised land. But we can't leave this passage without one more observation. Notice verse 13. It says, These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. This location gains a name that we've heard before, Meribah, quarreling. Remember, back with the prior generation, we had seen thirst, we'd seen quarreling, and we'd seen water from a rock. That place was named Meribah, and this place was named Meribah. The deeds of the fathers were repeated by their sons. They answered the question, Will we follow the faithful, or will we follow the faithless? They chose to be faithless like their fathers, and they chose quarreling with God instead of honoring Him. But let's go back to how we began. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children, to the third and the fourth generation. We saw that God allows the effects of faithfulness and faithlessness to last. But there's something else that we have to see. God says in the same breath, forgiving sin, while also saying, He will not clear the guilty. Perhaps we should learn another thing from God's statement. Faithlessness may produce disobedience and lasting consequences, but when we turn to God, He's willing to forgive time and time and time again. Moses won't suffer eternally for his sin. He will not forever be separated from God, but he will suffer the consequence of dishonoring him in the body. Our sins separate us from God and have awful consequences in this life. But if we change our ways and turn to Him, we will only find this. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Join us next time as Israel begins to meet their enemies in battle. The fight for Canaan is just heating up. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.